God. Amen. Praise to the God the Father, praise to God the Son, and praise to the Holy Spirit. The only true God, Yahweh. All praise goes to the God of Bible. Mm. Amen. He was in the beginning, and He is forever. Hallelujah. He is the Alpha and Omega. He is the King of Kings and Lord of all Lords. We praise to the Lord Jesus, who is risen glory of God. Amen. We praise to the Lord Jesus. He is the eternal Word of God, who came and died on the cross for the sin of mankind. Only Jesus. All praise goes to the Lord Jesus Christ. Bible tells us in the beginning, man and woman choose to separate from God. Yes. Bible tells us after the creation of men and woman, they sin against God and they sin against one another. Mm -hmm. Genesis account tells us God gave them the solution, solution of Messiah, who is going to come and destroy the Satan. Amen. Throughout Bible, God speaks to us through prophets, which points us to the Messiah. Yes. Without Messiah, we cannot be in the presence of God. Mm -hmm. And around first century, the eternal word of God. Amen. Lord Jesus steps in, lives among us, and died on the cross for the sin of mankind. So Praise that God. man and woman can be made right with God. So man and woman can spend eternity with God. Praise God. Praise to the Lord Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. Praise Amen. to him. And Jesus Christ is not only our God, Jesus Christ is not only truly man and truly God, he is not only the best example, but he is the one who offers us eternal life. Yeah. Scripture talks about marriage and scripture tells us we are the bride of groom. Yeah. We are the bride of Lord Jesus Christ. Marriage takes very important place in the Bible. Absolutely. Marriage is there right at the beginning. Uh, God makes man for woman. When Adam first sees Eve, he's so excited to have this lifelong companion, this lifelong partner. And it's something that Jesus, it goes a bit wrong in the middle when mankind starts to kind of, you know, go after other women. But that's never something that God actually affirms. When Jesus comes and preaches in Matthew 19, he says it again because God created them male and female. They'll be joined together uh, as man and wife and not become, go from being two to one flesh. And that union is for life. That's why marriage is such a precious and special thing in Christianity. And it's also mirrored in Christ's own relationship to his body, the church. Yeah. So today we are going to talk about marriage. What happens in marriage when men and women united, when men and women become one flesh? What happens? So you are married. What does marriage life look like, Lizzie? Married, married life is pretty good, you know. Do you do? <laughs> uh, we have children, we chat to each other, we have a house, we talk about normal stuff, we wash up, we share life. Um, but you know, it's it's the bedrock on which you know children are produced, and which uh, children are nurtured, uh, and which children are grown up to, to have a kind of a, the, the most emotionally stable life they can. And it's when lo love, exclusive love is modeled it's the it's the best way god really knew what he was doing when he made marriage between a man and a woman for life as marriage takes place between men and women for until they die mm. until they put us apart mm. we see throughout scripture when human beings stepped in and tried to do get on with their own way mm. and as we look at our lives in marriage we see Marriage is not only having sex, marriage is only not who is going to put the bins out, but marriage is, marriage is sharing life together. Yeah. Sharing life together. Yes. Sex is part of it, yes. but not all of it. No. So, is that what the Christian scripture teaches? Mm -hmm. We look at the Islamic scripture and we want to see what does Islam teach us about marriage. Yes. As Christian scripture stands out, marriage between one man and one more woman, we want to see what the author of the Quran, who is identified as the divine being Allah, how he puts 
marriage together. Mm. I have got Muslim friends who have got more than one wife, and they can support that from the Quran, mm -hmm. which already confirms that Quran goes against the teachings of the Bible. I'm afraid it does. The Bible says one man, one woman becomes one flesh. Yet, let's see what does Islam teaches on that. So. We need to go to Surah and nisa the women's Surah, Surah 4, Ayah 3, and it says this. And if you fear that you will not deal justly with the orphan girls, then marry those that please you of other women, i.e. you can marry more than one wife in order to help these girls, two or three or four. But if you fear that you will not be just, then marry only one of those your right hands possess, i.e. your slave girls. That is more suitable that you may not incline to injustice. Am I right to understand? Eternal word of Allah is stating you can have a wife, one, yep. and two, yes. and three, and four. And four. There's some in-house debate whether or not four is in fact the maximum number of wives you can have as a Muslim. So in somehow, God of, God of Islam goes against the God of Bible and goes against one and woman, one man and woman to become one flesh. Yep. Now suddenly how many flesh we end up? That's a one man plus up to four wives. Yeah, that's, that's already disturbing. Yeah, it's very disturbing. So as Quran gives us the limit of the wives as up to four, because mm -hmm. we look at the Islamic tradition and then we see when people become a Muslim, mm -hmm. if they had more than four wives, they needed a divorce and then keep to four to themselves. Right. Um, since Muhammad is supposed to be the best example to mankind and he is the one who Muslims need to follow, can you tell me how many wives did Muhammad have? Uh, so there's some dispute, but we know that he had somewhere between, I don't know, 9 and 11 or 12 wives. There's some in-house debate, for example, about some of them, whether or not Mary the cop, for example, was an actual wife or whether or not she was a slave girl. So Muhammad had more than four wives? Yes, he definitely had more than four. He definitely obviously had more than one. He had more than four, which is what the Quran says you're allowed if you're a Muslim. So, yeah. I'm struggling to put it together. So, Muslims believe Muhammad is the best example. Muhammad is the one who Allah trusted and gave his last revelation. And Muhammad is the one who was sent the whole world. Hmm. Yet, he's the one who went against his revelation and had more than not one, more than not two, more than not three, yet more than four wives. But he did also, of course, have special privileges. It seems that Allah gave him privileges that were just for him alone. We find that out in Surah 3350, that some things he was allowed to do just for him. But even that suggests to us that actually, you know, Allah seems to be uh, very nice to Muhammad, kind of give him special privileges. Uh, his revelation seems to be very convenient for him. Muhammad's uh, only for him. Why, why is that, I wonder? I wonder that too. <laughs> but when we look at the Surah 4, verse 3, we see Allah says, you need to treat your wives justly. Mm -hmm. If you cannot treat them justly, keep it to the one wife. Yeah. I believe, or I want to believe, if Muhammad had more than four wives, up to nine wives to eleven, mm -hmm. I am sure as a best example to mankind, he treated them justly. Hmm. And equally. That's so, not. And equally. Yeah. And equally. Yeah, that's and not it, what the sources the, teach us. The same amount of minutes with all of them the same. Really? Where you with him, sir? Yeah. Yeah, we can talk about that. Apart from Aisha, because she was special. Oh, so there is an exception, Aisha. Thank you so much, sir, that you've admitted that, that actually Muhammad didn't follow his own revelation. So but he did have a favorite, which you're not supposed to have according to the Quran. So when we look at the life of Muhammad, we see he was faithful to his first wife. Soon after Khadija died, suddenly he started getting Muhammad married with others. Because Muhammad has different uh, exceptions, different revelations for him. Mm -hmm. Everything is different. But for Muslims, they suppose it's different. And is that all right with you? How does it make you feel knowing that a man who's supposed to be the best example to mankind and man who has been followed by 1.8 billion Muslims had a different revelation to than his community? 
How does it make you feel, sir? It just doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense to you, right? It That's doesn't make the club. It doesn't make sense to me, sir. It doesn't make sense That's to me either. So let's see if Mohammed was able to treat his wife justly. Mm. Okay. Yeah. So let's look at the Aisha, for example. Mm -hmm. So we can't look at the example of Khatija because while he was married to Khatija, there wasn't any other wives. No. How did the so, marriage happen? We are not talking about the Khatija, but we will talk about that as well. So it was love in the got, first time. He got her drunk first. He got, he got her father drunk. And then in the morning, she told her father, because her father said, you're not going to marry this guy. But she told her father, you married me last night. And you were drunk. That's how they got So, married. so did Mohammed get him drunk? Yeah. Oh, got, that's interesting. That's an interesting know, way of getting a wife. Get the father drunk. To get, to get, to get him drunk mm -hmm. because he didn't want to marry to Okay, do you think that's a good way of getting a wife? Just get the get her father drunk. Do you think that's fine? I don't know about that okay. story. I don't know about that story. So let's look at let's look at another wives of Muhammad. So we've got Khatija. Mm -hmm. While Muhammad was married to Khatija, there wasn't any other wives. Okay? After Khatija, we've got Aisha, we've got Sauda, we've yeah. got Sophia, we've got Zainab, and then it goes on. Yeah. So let's look at this Sauda. Yeah. Why do we want to look at her? Uh, we want to look at her, Sauda because uh, we also want to test this claim that whether or not uh, Muhammad treated his wives justly. So what we know, what the Hadith tells us, is that Sauda, when she got old, she was getting old, she was worried that Muhammad was going to divorce her. And because this is something that she really didn't want, she gave up because Muhammad used to take it in turns to go to each of his uh, wives, you know, to sleep with them. And he said, rather than divorce me, why don't you, um, ha I'm going to give my night to Aisha. I'm going to give my night to Aisha. That's what she said. Sir, if you will, give me 10 minutes. Adnan, Adnan, give me 10 minutes. I'll talk to you. Adnan, I'll talk to you. Yeah. No, no, no. If you know he was lying. Yeah, let's do it. Let's do it. Sure. 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 Let's see. You're a liar. Can you tell me, can you tell me, where did you get that story that Muhammad got the father of Aisha drunk so we can sleep with his daughter? So no, that's Khadija. He said that. Oh, he said it. Yeah, he said it. Go, 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 Am I lying? Tell us. What, 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 this is listen, opportunity where did you get, where you get that story me. from? Yeah. That Muhammad, oh, number one, number one. Yeah. yeah, we can we can read it to okay. you. Should we read it to you? Let yeah, I read it. Okay. Old and fat. Oh, she was old and fat. Let's ask Let's, a question. Is it okay to get divorced to divorce your wife because she's, she's old and fat? Old and fat. Let, this is not in you. the Bible. So, just you realize. Yeah. But just Muhammad seems to be for mankind. Let me respond. That's so, she's old and fat. A gentleman here her. is telling us Sada was old and fat. And Muslims are telling us he is insulting the woman. Who is insulting? Yes. So let me respond. Stupid. Allah, he was saying. Sahih Bukhari, mm -hmm. one of the Islamic tradition, yeah. customs of Muhammad comes from Sahih Bukhari. Okay. 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 We're reading from your sources, sir. We're reading from your sources. Okay, Sahih Bukhari, 618. Okay, 618. Aisha. Sada, the wife of the Prophet, went out to answer the call of nature. After it was made, obligatory for the Muslim ladies to observe the way of. She was fat, huge lady. Now give me this for a minute. She was fat, huge lady. 
She was fat and thin. Okay? And any, everybody who knew her before could, before could recognize her. According to Islamic tradition, one of the most reliable hadith tells us Sadam was fat and huge lady. Okay? Are you okay with that? Because you are the one who was objecting what you are saying. One of the wives of Muhammad was a fat and huge lady. So, Quran talks about wives needs to be treated justly. If you can't treat them justly, marry only one wife. Yeah. Okay? So, and Muhammad had more than four wives. Okay? He had minimum nine wives. And one of the wives of Muhammad is Sarah. Yeah. So, did Muhammad treat it Sarah justly? That's the question we are asking. Okay? And when we look at who Sada is, we see Hadith gives us some description of her. Hadith tells us she was fat, um, rich lady. Okay? I don't have any problem with that. But let's see if anyone else had a problem with that. Do you believe? Do you believe Muhammad treated his wife equally? Okay, so I'm gonna give you some stories and I want to explain that to you. Like Jesus, like Moses, like all the prophets. Okay, let's we move on. You can't make mistake. Okay. Okay, let's so move on. Muslim makes a claim that Muhammad was like other prophets. He cannot make a mistake. Muhammad was not like other prophets. Muhammad was a sinful, sinful, and most sinful prophet. But now we want to see if Muhammad treated his wives equally. Yeah. So now we know Sada was fat and rich woman. And what else we know about Sada? We also know that Muhammad wanted to divorce her. She was afraid that Muhammad would divorce her because she's old. Now, is just being old grounds for divorce? Is being fat grounds for divorce? No, it's not. But around this time, Muhammad gets a very convenient revelation because it suddenly dawns on him, it seems, that actually he can't really treat his wives equally. So, In terms of methodology, what you said is a detail. It's just details. Those details are very important to Muslims because that's not what makes Muslims Muslim. Mm -hmm. No, it's not. This is not from Quran first. Oh, okay, it is, sir. It is. from Quran? No. Sister, read it. Okay. Now she's going to read it if you listen carefully. Okay. So this is Surah. Before we read Surah 4, Ayah 3, which says Muslims could marry up to 2, 3, and 4. Yeah. No, okay. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Oh, no, that's the, okay. 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 Sister, if you're okay. And then we're going to read from uh, Surah four one two eight. Okay. And if a woman fears from her husband contempt or evasion, yeah, there is no sin upon them if they make terms of settlement between them. And settlement is best. And present in human souls is uh, my version has selfishness. But if you do good and fear Allah, then indeed Allah is ever aware of what you do. So. What this verse is saying is that if the woman is afraid the husband will leave her, then she has to make terms of peace. It doesn't say anything to the husband. Hey, you can't just leave your wife because she's old. You can't just leave your wife because she's fat. It says to the woman, you need to make a settlement. But wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. It's it's here. So that's it, right? Okay, then we're going to read, then we're going to read 129. Let, 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 let me just... just just a moment. Just a moment. Sir, if you listen okay. to the full story, okay. can you listen to the full story, Sister Paul? Okay, okay. Sir, 129. Just, we'll, we'll come back to you, sir. We'll come back to you. 129. And this is interesting. Don't forget, Sir, 4, I, 3 said, if you have to be able to treat your wives justly. But now listen to this. 
129. And you will never be able to be equal between wives. Madame, I give you a question. You, it's it's just contradicts the previous Yes, it contradicts the previous verse. Even if he should strive to do so. So do not incline completely toward one and leave another hanging. Okay? Allah even says don't incline too much to one wife and leave the other hanging. What does he do with Sauda? He says, he effectively lets Sauda give her night to Aisha. Sauda is left hanging. Muhammad doesn't go, hang on a minute, Allah tells me I can't do that. He, he just goes along with it, just unashamedly preferring some wives, in particular Aisha, over others. And when we look at the Ibn Qadir account, we see that Sauda scared, she, sorry, Muhammad, uh, Muhammad wanted to divorce her, so Sada scared, therefore she gave her night to Aisha. Mm. And as you say, Allah does not step, steps in to condemn Muhammad, mm. but Allah because Allah comes and supports the actions of mm. Muhammad. Yeah. And there is no support to the Sada. None. Allah doesn't turn to Sada and then say, Oh my lovely slave of Sada Muhammad slave of Allah, it's, it's all right, Muhammad can't do that. Mm. Even though you are old, still I love you, Allah doesn't do that. No. Allah, Allah supports Muhammad for his action. Yeah. And then revelation comes. It's in the same surah. It is the same Allah talks towards the same angel and tells Muhammad, tells Muhammad people need to treat their wife justly. Mm. Yet, or not, yet according to one to eight. Muhammad steps in and destroys the revelation yeah. Allah gives to him. Yeah. Allah steps in and destroys the revelation Allah gives it to Muhammad. Unacceptable. Yeah. And that shows me actually that I'm not sure Muhammad is talking to God at all. I think it's a voice in his head that seems to comply with his every need. In this case, for his own sexual gratification, for his own preferring one wife over another. Because don't forget the, the hadith that we just read. It seems to be all about, again, it seems to be so sexualized. It's about who gets to spend what night with who. There's no sense of companionship. There's no sense of intimacy. There's no sense of all of the rest of life that seems to make up marriage. As we look at the Christian scripture, we see marriage means it's sharing life. Mm. But when we look at the Islamic writings, we see marriage is all about sex. Mm. People can live as a married couple without having sex every night. Muhammad, Muhammad can't have a sex with a fat huge woman or old woman, therefore he is alright that woman to give her life to her turn to Aisha. It could work out. They can just sit down at night. I don't know, they didn't have tele to watch it in those times, but they could still they could still have friendship. They could still talk about the life. But because she is old that she can't have sex, therefore she fear that Muhammad is going to divorce her. Yeah. Unacceptable. Unacceptable. And contradicts the previous revelation, of course. Of course, we see, we see when Muhammad fails to treat his wife justly, there is already there is a problem already in in the house. Yeah. We see Aisha gets the priority. Mm. Muhammad gets the revelation when he is in the garment of Aisha, mm. in the bed of Aisha, versus other wives are getting jealous of that mm. action. Mm. Other wives are asking, we want attention too. Yeah. Muhammad just shuts them down by saying, no, Allah gives me the revelation when I am in the bed or the garment of Aisha. Can you see? It's not only Muhammad using Allah for his own privilege. Allah steps in and then Allah makes a distinction between the wives of Muhammad. It is Allah according to Islamic tradition, who claims to send the revelation to Muhammad in the bed of Aisha. But it makes sense why most of the Islamic tradition is all about yeah. sex and sex because the revelation yeah. takes place in the bed. 
Yeah, but let's also talk about a little more background to that particular story. So we, we, we know from Islamic tradition, um, I think the reference is Bukhari, but I can look it up, that, I, that Muhammad's wives were jealous. They were jealous because whenever they wanted to send a gift to Muhammad, they always had to send it to Aisha's house. And they were getting fed up with this. They thought, well, why can't the gifts just be sent to whoever's wife Turner is? Then we can send it to Bukhari 347 700. Thank you. Let's just send it to whoever Turner is. Uh, they didn't think it was fair that it was constantly going to Aisha. And uh, then they send Umm Salama. Umm Salama is one of the wives who's disgruntled. And she goes to talk to Muhammad about this. And Muhammad, interestingly, doesn't say, actually, you know what? That probably is a little bit unfair. I can just solve this problem by you just sending the gifts wherever you like. Instead, he says, don't talk to me bad things about Aisha because I only get revelations in her bed or in apparently in the Arabic. It says her garment, which makes it even more disturbing. What an answer to that kind of problem. That doesn't tell me much about Muhammad's relationship skills. Uh, if anything, that stokes up jealousy. And again, it goes against Surah 4128, where he's not supposed to incline more to one wife than the other. And then what happens is Umm Salama gets even more annoyed and she says, your wives, he says, she says to him this, your wives request us to treat them and the daughter of Abu Bakr, meaning Aisha, on equal terms. And then Muhammad again, because he's such a sensitive soul to his wives, to Umm Salama, he says, don't you love whom I love, meaning Aisha? I mean, really, this is not very nice of him. Um, and so Zainab, also one of the disgruntled wives, goes to Aisha, demanding equal treatment to her face. And then Aisha gives us such an earful that eventually Zainab shuts up. And what does Muhammad say? She says, oh, wow, Aisha really is the daughter of Abu Bakr, probably meaning she's a bit feisty. In all of this scenario, in all of this scenario, at what point does Muhammad say, you know, I think I might have got things a bit wrong. Perhaps I haven't treated you as fairly as I can be. No, he doesn't do any of that. Instead, he perpetuates a situation of great inequality between his wives. Not acceptable. So even though Quran makes a claim that you can marry up to four wives, if you treat them justly, we see same Quran shows us Muhammad is a false prophet. Yeah. We see same Quran shows us Quran is a false book and Allah is false God. Because it is Muhammad again who goes against his revelation. It is Allah again steps in and help out Muhammad with yeah. his ha house issues. Yeah. And we can see some of how actually how cruel and how insensitive that Muhammad is to his wives. But he's meant to be the example for all Muslims today to follow. Thanks God that he's not example to us. Yeah. Maybe and he can take some example from us, no? <laughs> yeah. And his advice, we can see from the Hadith, also we can see from the Quran, that the advice he gives is not wasn't particularly relevant for the situation he was in at the time. And it certainly isn't relevant today. But this is a great time to compare the kind of advice that Jesus Christ gives. So in the Gospels, somebody comes to Jesus and says, teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me, right? It's not quite the same scenario, but it, there's, a, 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 um, there's a, a situation of, of conflict. And Jesus says to them, man, who appointed me a judge or arbiter between you? He's quite humble. He's also saying, why are you involving me this, with this dispute? You can use your own minds maybe to work this out. But then he says this, he says, watch out, be on your guard against all kinds of greed. Life does not consist in an abundance of possessions. Think of that. Isn't that amazing moral advice, both for them, he tells them not to be greedy. And today he tells us, be on your guard for all kinds of greed. Your life is not in the abundance of possessions. That was true 2000 years ago. And it's just as true today. So when we look at the, when we look at the marriage in Islam, if Jesus is an example for everybody to follow, as a wife or as a husband, if he's the person to follow, you can't do that with Jesus because he was never married. Good question. But you don't have to be married to give advice about marriage, right? Yeah. No, no, but you don't have the experience. Let me respond. You don't have the, hold on. You don't have the experience to deal with more people. Let the response. So Jesus is lacking that knowledge when it comes to an issue between mm -hmm. a man and his wife or a man and his wife. Mm -hmm. Because, because we need to know 
For example, on Solomon, who had 900 wives and problems the Bible, how did he treat them equally? How did he spend his time between 900 wives? Let me respond. Yeah? So, so it's an unfair comparison let me, let me on this issue. Wait, wait. Muslims are Muslims, step Sidan and Tals are married, therefore he's lacking knowledge of the marriage. Mm. Muslim steps in and tells us. Look at the example of Solomon. He had hundreds of wives. How did he treat them equally? Let me respond. Let me respond. So, let me respond. Sir, there is no verse in my Bible tells me, Hatun, from now on, Solomon is your example. Let me no, he's not. My no, king not. is Lord Jesus Christ. Yeah. Bible tells me marriage is supposed to be between one man and one woman. Bible doesn't tell me marriage is supposed to be between one woman, one man versus four women. That's what Islam teaches. Bible doesn't tell me as you have one husband and one wife, treat them equally because you will have to treat that there is only one person. There is no any mathematical uh, problem needs to be done there. I haven't finished that. Yet it is Quran makes a claim that you need to treat your wives equally while Muhammad failed to do that. So why do you think, why do you think Jesus needs to be married to, to tell people what marriage life looks like? Muhammad was married, he failed. Mm. He failed his wife, he failed his God. I don't need someone, I am answering your question, sir, just wait. We don't need someone to tell us how we need to go to bathroom. We don't need someone to tell us which hand we need to hold, which hand we need to hold the fork when we eat food. We need someone to give us the best example and best teaching. That is Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, so Jesus, so Jesus, said, even so though you, you said, tell me he's lacking knowledge, so you, said, you just went against your Quran and made a claim that actually your Quran is false. Quran, because Quran tells us Jesus is the sinless person. So Jesus, let me tell you marriage in the eyes of Jesus. Jesus is our God and our King. Jesus is our groom. We are the bride of Christ. Therefore, we look at what Jesus did for his wife, what Jesus did for his bride. He gave up his life for his bride. That is the teaching Bible tells us. Therefore, we do not need Jesus to be married to tell us what marriage looks like. I would rather I would died for his bride. I would rather take the advice about someone who is not married, someone who is still sinless, someone who laid down his life for mankind, someone who proved that he was God in the flesh by what he said and what he did, someone who in his pre-incarnate state as part of the trying God invented marriage in the first place, I would rather take his advice on marriage than on someone who cannot keep to his own revelation, who couldn't, who married nine people, who treated his wives absolutely miserably, who, who cannot give decent relationship advice. Sorry, I'd rather, I know which one I would choose. I would never ever go to Muhammad for marriage advice. Jesus gives us the principle of marriage by dying on the cross for his bride. Yes. Therefore, we don't need Lord Jesus to be married to tell us how we need to have sex with our husbands or our wives, how we need to talk to our children, how do we need to share life with our partners. Jesus is the groom who died for his bride. That is our principle and example coming from Lord Jesus. As we look at the teachings of the Quran today on marriage, we saw Quran itself by just looking at example of Muhammad with his wives proves that Quran is a false book. Yeah.
Muhammad is a false prophet, therefore you should not be followed. Yet, they've got the perfect example on other side. Perfect teachings on other side. Bible teaches men and women are made in God's image. Men and women, with the marriage, they become one flesh yes. and live life, share life yes. with God. Yeah. And also Bible tells us men and women are sinful. Yeah. They, did, they sin against God, they sin against one another. Yet it is the same Bible who gives us the solution yes. for the sin. Yes. yes. The solution for sin, there is only one solution for sin, and that is that we confess it. We realize that we are sinners. We realize that we're cut off from God. And we repent. That means we turn away from what we know that's wrong. And we say, thank you, God, so much for sending your beloved son, Jesus, to die on the cross. This is something that was predicted right from the beginning, right from Genesis 3, when men and women fell out of relationship with God. God steps in to the person of his son, Jesus Christ, to be our Passover lamb, to be our sacrifice, to pay our penalty, our only hope in life. Muslims, Christians, whoever is watching, our, your only hope is to repent and put your faith in Jesus who laid down his life for you to pay the price for your sins so that you can have a restored relationship with God and eternal life with him forever. So praise to the God who redeems us. Amen. Praise to the Lord Jesus Christ who died on the cross for the sin of mankind. Praise him. Amen.